Welcome back, Smite fans, for the fourth and final set of day one of the SCC Phase 2 playoffs. It is Dolson and Aggro on the desk this time around. Aggro, maybe the, the surprise of the day is that the first couple of sets all went three games, Basket and the boys 2-0, maybe not quite as surprising. <laughs> no, especially when they're going to look as good as they did in that last set. But North America, I think, is looking to be a little bit more competitive now. We've had some roster switch-ups. I mean, this locked and goaded team, a very different look than what we saw from them in the first phase where they had Sino there on that team, now El Leon in that jungle slot, and Ionic yep. stepping in as a support instead of Quig. So you get a whole lot of competitive experience between those two to replace the competitive experience lost when Sino moved up to join Obey. That's right. The winner of this game has to move on and face Baskin and the boys, though. So a, a prize, I'm not so sure. But it'll be a lot of fun to watch the semifinals nonetheless. Let's talk about this locked and goaded team, though. And, and you, you sort of mentioned his name. And it's, it's Elian and, and maybe some of the difference that he's been able to make for this squad. Yeah, I think that he definitely has made a difference for this team because when you lose a leader like Sino, I think it really causes your team to have to go through a whole lot of changes. Not only do you lose your identity as the main guy you're going to play through, and a guy like Sino, but your shot calling and your and your just understanding of how you want to play the map, just having that in-game leader, I think, is really important. And, and Leon is certainly a guy who we've seen do that for a lot of teams in the past. I think he's matured a lot in his gameplay. I don't think that you're going to hear him yelling raw 50,000 times <laughs> in a row anymore. I think we've, we've gotten past that. And I think that, that he can be a really solid addition to this squad. He's looked very good for them. I think he and Ionic together are, are, are a combination yes. that I want to see and how well they're going to play around Pagon in that mid 3v3 because Pagon is, is a younger guy, a really, really mechanically talented player, and now being flanked by two players who have a lot of competitive experience I think is really, really beneficial to him, and I'm excited to see what that's going to do for Pagon, and it, not only today but the rest of the year. Agreed. I, I think building up uh, the rest of that team ever so important. I'm excited to see what this kind of new iteration of the Locked and Goaded squad is going to be able to do. Now you look at their opponents, Bloogie and the Woogies, and, and maybe kind of springboarding off that point aggro for, for Pagon in the mid lane. His lane opponent in Crimson has been, been one of the biggest factors in Bloogie and the Woogies and a lot of their success so far uh, this year. And that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody who's watched Crimson play before. This dude is legit. This dude's a beast. I mean, just no doubt about it in my mind. Had tons of success over on the console scene. Now playing on PC, just as much success. I think that there's a real argument to saying that Crimson is the, is the next one up in terms of getting called up to the SPL. I think this guy is that good and can really perform at that level. But he's going to have a tough time today because Pagon is really the, the main competition for him right. in the mid lane as far as players who haven't yet made it into that SPL tier. So I'm excited to see these two play against one another, but I'm always just excited to watch Crimson play. I think the guy's a beast. I've talked to a lot of his former teammates inbound and in stir. I mean, guys I have a lot of respect for who do it at the top level or have done at the top level before. All of them have just nothing but great things to say about Crimson as a teammate and as a player. So I'm excited to see what, what's in the future for him and, and excited to see what he can do today. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun to follow. You, you sort of mentioned the 3v3, how strong it is for locked and goaded between uh, Leon and, and Pagon and Ionic. W what do you kind of make of that 3v3 matchup overall here in this set? I mean, between Crimson, Panda Turtle, and, and Gamma, maybe seems like Bluegie and the Woogies could have their hands full. Yeah, I think so. I think Gamma has, has really been pretty inconsistent in that support role. He has games where he plays really, really well, and then he has games where he'll pick the things like the Wukong support and not really bring a whole lot to that mid-3v3. So I think that it's really, really important to see what Gamma is going to do in this set because you can expect Ionic to be pretty rock-solid in that long lane and on those rotations yep. into the mid lane. It's up to Gamma to really try and match that. Agreed. Smart players across the board, nonetheless. Picks and bands is maybe where we could start to see some of these threads spin out. Maybe you start to draft yourself something a little bit more aggressive for locked and go to Bloogie and the Woogies need a little extra peel. We'll just have to wait and see. I mean, one of the big factors this weekend, Agro, is Persephone obviously uh, being allowed, again, I suppose, competitively, but not necessarily through picks and bands. I'm not sure that changes here. No, I, I don't think so. I, it, 
getting Persephone through picks and bans is something that I would only expect if a couple people are popping off on some on some crazy picks that you really feel like you need to take away later on in the set. Gods like Persephone that are perceived to be very strong, but we haven't seen in competitive play for a long time, usually only get through in game three scenarios or games four and five, if we're talking best of five territory, usually they're kind of force open. Right. Don't ever expect her to, in a game one sort of scenario. I just don't think we'll see it. Yeah, not expected and won't see it here. Boogie and the Woogies take Persephone off the board first overall. Interesting strategy, though, from Locked and Goaded here. They're going to tailor a couple of their first three bands towards Aquarius in that solo lane, assuming that's where the Jormungandr was headed. But but King Arthur, Jormungandr, two solo laners that can not only start well, control that lane off the bat, but then start to make a big impact when rotating through. And maybe Vimana fits into that category as well. Solo okay. lane, maybe... A, a focus point here for Locked and Goaded. Seems that way. It seems like they've got a lot of respect for Aquarius, as they should. I mean, he's the one who has the most experience over on that Belugi and the Woogie side. So Locked and Goaded feeling like they want to get Relentless One on a positive matchup and take some of those comfort picks away from Aqua. A little surprised, but, I mean, Vamana's a really good band right now, I think, with the Golden Blade buff. We saw how potent it was in Mask's hands just last game, and it's a good flex pick still into that solo lane, but it's going to leave open things like Yamoja, and, and I just don't know that I would have been super comfortable giving this Yamoja right. over to Ionic, who has been really, really impactful on picks like this in the past. Yeah, my, my initial thought was, well, we've seen Yamoja today and previously, and it's, you know, not necessarily hit the mark fully, but could totally be player dependent. And I'm glad you brought up Ionic, because if you're talking about a god that Ionic can look good on, Yamoja absolutely in that category. So I, I expect big things out of her here in this game. The return answer, though, from Boogie and the Woogies here is a Merlin locked in for that mid lane pick first overall. And then an Amaterasu to follow. Normally you assume that's straight out of the solo lane, but we have seen... Slightly different priority there. Amaterasu jungle notably yeah. a couple of times in our previous set. That's a good point. I mean, Ama has historically really been solo laner and support. Now, it, I think adding jungler into that mix is, is something to watch out for. But with the way that Gamma has been picking his gods, I don't think that you can rule this out of support. So it's really a three-way flex here for Bluey and the mm -hmm. Woogies, which is very strong. But you leave Locked and Goaded open to getting a lot of comfort picks. Thor there for El Leon in the jungle. And now Kamazot for Relentless One in that solo lane. I like this Awilix pickup, even though it, it tips the hand that this Ama is not going to be in the jungle. Right. It gives you a really good shutdown option against the Yamoja. Clearly, the, the Panda Turtle and the rest of Bluey and the Woogies had this sort of pick in mind by leaving Yamoja open. You don't leave a god like that open without a, without a game plan. And then Relentless One kind of picks into your hands anyways by picking a leap in that solo lane. Right. So I feel like snatching our Willix early is a good idea. Well, what do you make of that jungle matchup? I mean, we've obviously seen Thor a good bit, one of uh, Elayon's strong picks. Uh, again, between Yamoja for Yannick and, and Thor there for Elayon, expect big things. But haven't seen the Awilix v Thor matchup all that much. Do you have any uh, notions as to which way that might look? I think Awilix is really underrated right now. I think a lot of the itemization really helps her quite a bit. Erendite is such a phenomenal pickup on that god. You, you've got Hydra's in a really good spot right now. She uses Heartseeker well into the late game. I think that just in the, in the overall scope of things, she should be getting picked more. Thor is one of those picks that can give her some trouble because of the range CC, but that's kind of true for every character because range stuns are real good all the time. And so Thor is going to cause problems for that, but she wins 1v1 boxing matchups really, really well. And I don't think Thor is an exception. Yep. Oh, catch up on some of the bands that we've had here up to this point. Early solo lane priority for Locked and Goated, then support around the final two picks there. Maybe a little bit of flex with Sobek there. Woogie and the Woogie's are going to have to look elsewhere to get Gamma something comfortable. We're start, we, we, we talked about the 3v3 being ever so important, and now we've seen, or now we see rather, what Locked and Goated want to do. They've got the Yamoja to rotate out of that long lane Thor there for some early and immediate impact. Raijin as well to complete that 3v3, and then Hachiman to complete the draft. We highlighted three big players for Locked and Goated. Do you like what picks they'll have going into this game? Yeah, I do quite a bit. The Emoja Thor Raijin is just such a strong 3v3 core. It's good early game. It transitions well into late game. It's got sustain, CC, 
poke damage, all in damage. It's one of the best 3v3s that you could have in the meta right now in my mind. Anytime I see a Kamazots, that's just where my mind goes as to a question mark on the composition because it can be so good when it gets ahead. It just becomes unkillable. The sustain is really solid. The damage is there. It's unpeelable in the ultimate. But if it falls behind, which I think it is liable to do up against something like the Awilix, which can camp you pretty well, it gets a little bit spooky because you do have no CC. A slow is your only sort of utility that you're bringing to the table. And that can be a, a recipe for disaster pretty quickly. So for me, I'm looking at how well Relentless One is going to play on this Camazots, and that's going to be the main factor for Locked and Goaded success. Agreed. Seems to be awaiting in the wings. Tipping the scales, maybe, is this Camazots. Game number one will go down to Finch to kick it off. It's the final set of day number one of our circuit playoffs here. So what better way for us to move into that with Fitch and Lermy? And if it's such an important game, then how could you forget to vote in our poll? Make sure that you're letting us know in chat who you think will win. And then we'll put it on the screen and we'll give you, you know, we'll give you your yeah, yeah, yeahs if you're right. We'll see. Who knows if chat's going to be able to find <laughs> it. But it's me and Lermy here as he moved into the start of this game. And so far, nothing particularly crazy, I would say, here in these drafts. Everything going about the way that we would expect. So I'm going to ask you here, Lermy, do you agree with aggro? Do you think that we might be moving into a time where Wheelish might be a little bit stronger than people are giving her credit for? Because she could certainly work here in this draft. I can see it. I don't necessarily know if I agree. I think a Wheelix does have a lot of really great niche picks, and sure, this is kind of one of them that can do it. We've seen previously that a Wheelix does work as a solid counter to Yamoja because that is not only the uh, knock up onto her, but it can also knock up her own teammates who don't normally have jumps. So if someone's going into that Riptide and they unexpectedly get pulled back by the Wheelix, there's nothing really they, they can do about it other than, at that point, other than maybe like beads it away. But at this point, I mean, it's really going to depend on how this Wheelix goes. I think that if Panda Turtle can get online, it's going to be a really good look for Bloogie and the Woogies. I think it certainly could be. There's more spaces, I think, that people are willing to give credit for to this Awilich, so maybe Panda Turtle can show us. And as you mentioned, that Yamoja on the other side will likely be the focus of where she's looking for to try and find those knockups. Maybe a good place for us to focus as well. That's Ionic here piloting the Yamoja, who you all should certainly recognize from his many stints up at the SPL level. Now back down here at the circuit playoffs, and I think that he should be able to bring some veteranship here to this lead, to this team. He won't be alone in that regard. El Leon, who you might remember uh, one one time under the name Chapo, certainly another member that's had plenty of experience, played in console, played up at the SPL as well. I think this locked and goaded roster, alongside some of that obvious talent from like Stewart and Pagan, Relentless One, who have made plenty of plays in their own name, I think this could be a really scary roster. Having that SPL talent alongside these up-and-coming guys is really important because the SPL guys bring kind of a different level of experience to play. When you're able to have someone who's been in a situation where they have really solid shot calling and really solid playmaking, it's gonna work, but check out this rotation from Panda Turtle, he's blinking in! Looking for a relentless one, but couldn't quite grab him. If he could have gotten that knockup, that could have started the whole chain. But always keeping his head on a swivel, it appears, is relentless one. I don't even think there's any wards on that top side. That's just good awareness and ability to stay mindful of when a rotation might be coming. Meanwhile, over in duo, Ionic and Stuart, after getting some pressure, starting to move into the jungle to look if they can strip away purple, but they're thinking better of it. Instead, they'll return the lane and get right back to farming. But as you mentioned, I think a little bit earlier here, that veteran presence is going to be pretty big here for Locked and Goaded, but I don't think Bloogie and the Woogies are any strangers in that department either. Crimson, an elite player at the console level, a part of that Astral team that, that was giving everybody else fits. I think that they've got plenty of experience in their own right as the purple buff almost gets stripped away. Blugan with a good axe stops it, but there the whole while is Stewart who would get secured by Locked and Goaded. Yeah, Ike's going to be taking quite a bit of poke from that scream. It'll continue ticking on him for a little while longer, but it was just good that he didn't have to use the beads there. And that's not you making a mistake here. This Yamoja does have beads, and that's kind of the whole situation, is we talked about how a Wheelix can be a counter to Yamoja earlier, and it's kind of right. why Yamoja kind of sat in that spot where is she OP, is she not OP, where people have figured out that she's super easy to lock down, but when she buys the beads, it's a little harder to do that. It is. It adds some extra safety here to this Yamoja, and I think the Riptide gets a little bit under 
valued in terms of its ability to get her out of some tough situations at times too. So when you pair in that extra on-demand CC immunity, then yeah, I think Emoja can be a tough one to lock down in these early games as there's already some presence from Chapo in left. I think he wants to gank. Gamma has been locked down already and first blood goes to Stewart on locked and goaded. Thor at level five, ganking duo. as an oldie but a goodie. This is just that entire knowledge that you're really hoping comes out of your Thor. The second you hit level five, you're already pre-planning for that moment. You head over to the left-hand side, you pop the ultimate, probably in the, the gold period range where there just is no vision, and they just weren't ready for it. And that is a, like you said, play as old as time. And it was a relatively deep dive as well. I mean, Gamma was basically underneath the tier one tower as Panda Turtle's in some trouble. Point blank, Tycho drums, and there's no way to evade the damage. Locked and goaded get their second kill of the game as Pagon is able to lock down one member way over near Fire Giant. That just seemed like a really strange spot to be. I don't know why Panda Turtle was up that far. He should basically still have every a good idea of every timer on the map at this point. So maybe the idea was for him to go and set up for an invade on the blue, but just a little bit too early on it as nothing is up quite yet on the map. And at this rate, it might even lead to Aquarius's blue getting stolen away. As you can see the rotations from everyone on Lock and Goated coming on over. Yeah, I don't think Bloogie and the Woogies realized that they were actually in the trap of the other team. Aqua already taking away too much damage, locked down, and Relentless wants to get onto the board as well. Finds a kill, and Aqua gonna have to take a timeout. Now, Panda Turtle is here. He does confirm the blue, gets back up on to Zuku, but ends up getting hit by the wall. Still safe at this point, so no more kills coming the way of Locked and Goaded, and they don't get the blue buff invade. So sure, they lost Aqua, but not as bad as that could have gone. I mean, Aqua is going to have to find a way to get back in time for that blue buff, and if he doesn't get it, then that's kind of spelling some trouble for this Amaterasu. You don't typically see Amaterasu in solo very much, and that's because it takes her a pretty long time to get online. A lot of people like to say level 9 to level 11 is kind of where she starts to kind of be a character again. And so if Aqua isn't going to get this blue, it's just going to spell trouble coming for the next couple of minutes, and it looks like he actually was not able to pick it up. So unfortunate there for Aqua. And that's going to hurt him, as you said, a bit reliant on having that extra mana sustain to try and keep even with Kamazots, who has just about every kind of sustain you could want. Gamma forcing Pagon's ultimate in mid, it looks like, might have been the ultimate being used. No, Gamma still has it, but at the very least, Pagon still has his beads as well. So a good trade for him, as it only costs him the ultimate for his safety. At least there is that, but honestly, if we're going to pick a place to fight, I want them to show some more presence over on this left-hand side. Now that Pagon really can't rotate without those Taiko drums, they've got to show some presence back onto this Hachiman who grabbed the kill earlier. But the fact of the matter is, it's the other jungler showing up there. There is Leon ganking over in left, but over in right, there's a gank from Blugin the Woogie, so action on both sides. Blugin is the one that ends up falling first, but what about Relentless One? He still has the bat out of hell. That's a nightmare scenario for Blugin the Woogies, where they try and trade pressure, but instead it only comes out in favor of Locked and Goaded, and they're going to collect. They head right to the Gold Fury here, Lurmy, to try and bring this one down as well. Gold Fury burned quickly, and suddenly Locked and Goaded have a commanding lead. We're seven minutes into the game, and they've got a 4,000 gold lead. That's insane. This is kind of nuts. This is the second and third seed. These guys are right neck and neck with each other in the right. North American SCC. I just can't really see a universe that these two teams were not positioned that way where they would be in that same kind of ranking. Yeah, this is, it's pretty nuts that they're this far apart here at this point. And Lermy, what do you think about these solo lane ganks? That's twice now that we've seen Panda Turtle try and spend some attention on the solo side to maybe make something happen. But if his ultimate is up for Relentless One, I don't see how there's any gank potential. The problem is, is that you picked a solo owner that doesn't have a lot of pressure, so he's not going to be able to do a whole lot there. So they're trying to compensate for that, especially because Cam is here too. And they're on top of Relentless One. Trying to see if they can find a blue buff invade. Relentless One does not have the ultimate this time. The lockdown is there from the Feather Step, and Bluegi and the Wookies finally make their way onto the board and a successful blue buff invade. So, just as we were questioning maybe the the, the viability of these continued solo lane ganks, Bluegi and the Wookies really double down and are able to finally kill him.
at least they doubled down on it, man. If you have a mistake, you know, you got to commit to it. So at least right. they finally got something out of it. Like, what, the third time they made a rotation over there? So, you know, they got something, finally. A kill is on the board for them, and it's slowly going to help them crawl back into a spot where they can retain the lead, perhaps. But, you know, they still have to deal with the juggernaut right now that has been LD on. He's participated in all four of the kills across the board, and they really need to find a way to slow him down or at least stop letting him just come over there and claim the life of the carry. And this is Thor's part of the game, generally speaking, right? Right around now when he's got that ultimate and it allows him to really stretch the map thin because it can affect so many different parts of it at a wider range than even a wheelish with all that extra movement speed from the Suku can quite match. So it's maybe not too surprising that the Thor has been able to get off to this good of a start, but all the same, Blue and the Woogies need a response to it. They have been looking for these solo lane ganks. That's been the response so far, but Relentless One's done a great job of only falling to them once as Gamma narrowly avoids getting locked into the Gold Fury pit. Ionic's gonna throw down the waves though, and Gamma's gonna be able to slip right through the cracks, but he is gonna respond with his own ultimate in turn. Yeah, Leon is not able to find anything with that dunk. Right up goes Panda Turtle, able to make it safely to the other side of the wall, but now Gamma is locked down to the Purple Buff pit after all. Ionic nearly gets pulled in, but there are those beads you highlighted earlier on, saving his life and denying anything for Blugi and the Woogie. So a ton of cooldowns expended. No one has their ultimate left except Relentless One, but no kills show up either. Aquarius has finally hit that sweet spot of where Amaterasu can finally come online. About to be finished with those blues, but she does actually have the shield, so she is going to be sustaining quite a bit. And we've talked about before, kind of with Amaterasu jungle, how the auto attacks are a very important part of her kit, especially right. when she's going into this Berserker shield. So just the fact of that alone is able to help her pressure it out here. And they're trying once again to steal away this blue buff, and it looks like Relentless One's just going to give that one up, noticing... Crimson's here too. I mean, I'm not gonna walk into three people. I'll, you know, you can have that blue buff. No, it, would, it certainly wouldn't make sense for a Relentless One to stick around there and fight there. So this has to be the continued response. You're asking for it earlier. What can they do about this Thor? There's kind of two schools of thought. You can follow him, get over there and try and make it an even fight, or you can kind of ignore it and try and do your own thing somewhere else and just have equivalent value come from that. And up until now, it hasn't quite worked. But Crimson getting a little bit of pressure over Pagon. He's able to rotate over to right and get there to make sure they get that blue buff. When they show that much presence, then the solo lane gang make a lot more sense to me. I think they did have to just pick one person, and so they did decide to focus out this Camasots, because as we talked about in Whoa. picks and bans, it can be a little bit dangerous to deal with that over the Emoja, but a lot of ultimates expended here, but it looks like everyone's just gonna back off. The waves came down, but other than that, I mean, it looks like everyone's safe at this point. Yeah, I think that everyone's going to make it out of there. Ambitious is the word that I want to use there for Gamma, trying yeah. to find a way to make that play end up working. I think that was based on the information that they knew that Emoja's beads were down right after that play uh, from the Awilish trying to pull her back in with that ultimate and then not quite working. But feel, felt a bit forced there to me, Lermy. I don't know if they were really going to have much kill potential. I think they were kind of looking for something. It's kind of been the whole game, really, is they're just dealing with the aggression that's coming out from the <laughs> other side, and they need to find some way to get back into it, right? So Gamma says, I have ultimate. Emoji doesn't have beats. Let's make it happen, guys. And I mean, they tried, right? <laughs> At the very least, though, that did get the ultimate out from Ionic and from Pagon in response. So maybe they can leverage that somehow in, in, into a way that they can use. They know they don't have to worry about the Tycho drums or the River's Rebuke, at least for a while. But still, it's locked and goaded. That are the aggressors. They're up into the Chaos Jungle looking for a purple invade. Panda Turtle is nearby, but it doesn't look like he was quite able to get there in time. The steward and the rest of the boys from Locked and Goaded just going to fall back. They are going to try and take away this Alpha Harpy, but that might be an issue Whoa. with the blink in from Gamma to try and slow him down. But a nice Riptide is actually going to try and get him away, but the knockup is still good on Ionic, but he gets out with one HP. And Leon finds the wall. That means he gets the kill onto Panda Turtle. What about Blugan, though, on the backside? Leap is down for him, but he still has the beads, but it's Gamma that was in trouble. Big burst damage from Stuart, and they put the support down, and now suddenly Blugan's stuck on the wrong side of town. Stuart on the backside of him to prevent any kind of retreat, so the Leap gets cut off by Pagon, who's made his way to the left-hand side. Thunder Crash locks him down, and suddenly Locked and Goaded have seven, a three for zero that they miraculously made out of nothing. 
That could have been a really big mistake there for Langton Goaded, but all of a sudden it just turned completely around, and that's just off the back of Panda Turtle not being able to successfully secure the kill onto Ionic. If they'd been able to take down the Yumoja, at least they get something, right? And maybe even the rest of the fight gets slowed down a little because Ionic still hung around and threw out some Riptides to be able to get his team in and out if they needed it. So knowing that that extra bit of support was there, it just allowed Langton Goaded to really be entirely free in the rest of that fight. And you mentioned this earlier, Lurmy, that they had to find some way to deal with El Leon. And I said that I liked them countering it by putting some pressure on Solo in response. But to me, it looks like they've shifted to now they want to be here where Leon is and try and counter it out. Do you like that adjustment to try and match his rotations? Or would you rather them go back to trying to gank Solo somehow? The real reason is because the Primal Fury is up, and that's exactly why El Leon is getting aggressive here. They have been basically sitting over here the whole time, but unfortunate ultimate there is it's nowhere near where Blugen was, but a good stun and double tap will put some poke under this hunter, but everyone else has shown up from Blugen and the Moogies, and Gamma is trying to force something, but there goes the ultimate from a Wheelix, and it looks like everyone's got to get out. Yeah, how many times is Gamma going to get locked down in the purple buff pit? But it's Panda Turtle that melts. Big damage from Pagon, puts him in a coffin. Gamma able to grab one with that ultimate, but Pagon's on a rampage, a double kill onto Blugen. Gamma was the one initially locked down, but all his carries died around him as Pagon gets the triple, bringing the absolute warpath here to Blugen and the Woogies as they struggle throughout this early game. What a shame. Just barely out of range was Panda Turtle when using that Gravity Surge, and honestly, if he had been able to completely lock down Ionic during that fight, I could see that going the total opposite way, where Bloogie is the one coming out on top, but everyone was forced into that corridor as soon as the walls came out, and basically there was just no response to be had. They were split up between one side of the wall and the other, and Gamma was not there either to be able to protect them. He got caught on the opposite side of everyone else. And this is now starting to get into real scary territory if you're Belugi and the Woogies. Three levels down for Blugen over in the long lane. The one lane that you put pressure on in solo is actually even, if not maybe a half level, in favor of Relentless One. Two level lead in the jungle, level lead in mid. Stuff's starting to get completely out of control now for Lock or for Blugi and the Woogies, rather. And they might not get to be the aggressors again for a while. They've got to find a way to get some kind of counter initiation going. I imagine Panda Turtle's a big part of that, but what can he do when he gets locked? down like this wall into the Riptide is nearly enough for the kill. Split a little bit there on the targets, part going after Gamma, part going after Krim, but it looks like it'll be enough to at least zone them away from this Pyromancer, and meanwhile it was Relentless on the back starting it up, and that's basically free, only trading out two ultimates to be able to get the freest Pyromancer of their lives, and like you said, this is going to be dangerous. If they keep letting this happen and they keep being as disorganized as it seems like they have been, Black and Goat are just going to continue to steamroll this game. Yeah, the only good news for Blue and the Woogies is that at this point, Locked and Goaded have kind of taken everything. I mean, like, the Fury is down at this point, Pyromancer's down as well, and I don't know how comfortable they are going for a 16-minute Fire Giant. So this should buy a little bit of time for Blue and the Woogies to try and stabilize is too strong a word, but at least breathe for a moment. As Stuart gets aggressed on in left, I love this idea. They get the ultimate and the beads out from Stuart off that combo between Blugen and Panda Turtle. That is basically all of his safety just immediately eliminated. He's got the Aegis, of course, which is very nice to have, but at the same time, if you're getting chased down by this Awelix, or even if there's a rotation from Gamma, it's not going to save your life in that instant. So they've just set themselves up for yet another gank, and they obviously have some time to do it because, like you said, Yuri's down, Pyromancer's down, and I don't think they'd be going for a Fire Giant at 17 minutes, but Pagon's really pushing the, the limit here as he's throwing some shots over the wall with the Tycho drums, just trying to scare out Crimson, and he's going to have to head back to base. Yeah, I'd say that's about their only fear at this point, Lermy, is that Locked and Goaded would step up into their jungle and try and catch them as they're moving around, because there aren't a lot of objectives to sort of act as that homing beacon to pull them in where you know where the fight's going to be. So Blue and the Woogie should still try and take a deep breath, try and take stock. They know Crimson is not that far behind, and Merlin damage can still be hugely relevant at this point. The next most relevant member is going to be Aqua. I think that if Blue and the Woogies do anything, it's got to happen around those two, just based on their relevance. Up again goes El Neon. He's looking for a shot on Blugen, who pops the beads preemptively, so it looks like he may be out. Over the wall comes Panda Turtle, and so he'll have that extra bit of safety, and around the bend comes Gamma with the ultimate. 
still trying to see if they can lock down anyone else, but it's Gamma that looks like he's the one that got grabbed. Ionic gets pulled in, but he just stands in the damage, confident as ever, even getting hit by Crimson, and it is not enough. So they find their kill on the Gamma in response, and now they can start looking to maybe get aggressive in this jungle. They don't want to go for the tower, but red buff is up, purple's about to spawn as well. There's a great chance for Locked and Goaded to strip away the farm. And that's exactly what they've been doing. Pagan and Elneon do split up from Stuart, but it doesn't really matter because no one from Bloogie and the Woogies has really found the, the confidence here to aggress on them. They're so far ahead at this point that even if two of them went up against one, I honestly feel like Elneon could get out. Pagan could get out. It just seems like at this point they need to be running around as a death ball or it's not going to work. But are you surprised at all that this early to mid game has gone so completely and locked and goaded its favor? I mean, I think I would give Thor and Raijin that slight edge over the Awilish Merlin in terms of who's going to want to be a bit more active this early, but they could certainly compete, I would have thought. But up until now, they've been relatively outclassed, Lerms. I think it really just has to come down to where Panda Turtle put his focus, and I don't think that's necessarily his fault. He had a game plan, and the team just did not collectively do what they needed to do. They thought, okay, Thor's going to come over to our dual lane every single time. We're going to respond this way. But it just turned out that they couldn't get really anything going over there at all, and so they put themselves at that disadvantage. Like you said, they picked the wrong school to go to, and they just did not get the same <laughs> level of education. <laughs> Unfortunate. It's a little bit too late now to have recognized it, but maybe it'll help them out their next go around as Blue and the Woogies have really struggled here in this game. They're going to need to bunker down and make some defense happen, maybe even find a nice pick onto Relentless One, but he's so tanky. And in fact, I'm sure he'd love to draw some attention to the right side of the map because the rest of the team is grabbing Oni Fury. Only Blugan is nearby, and he'll pay for it with his life for stepping in. Aegon from Max Reigns gets the kill. Oni Fury goes down as well. And the only member who might struggle now is Ionic, but the Reviver's Rebuke cuts off the aggression. Bead saves his life, and now Leon is here, not able to lock down any more members, so they turn their attention towards Gamma. All alone in the back line, does get off the Whirlwind of Rage and Steel, but it will be his Swang Son, as even Ionic is able to find a kill. Just, at this point, they need to find something, right? They're still... Even at 20 minutes in this game after they've only gotten one kill, and that was on Relentless One, they've been walking in kind of one by one, trying to make these hero plays and start to at least make some room for something to happen, but it just, once again, is not working out. They need to either be together as a team and commit to something, or they just need to start over and GG go next. And a turtle has been put down as well. Stewart gets the kill, but a lot of that damage came from Pagon. What a performance from their backline here this game. A collective 10-0-8 between the Raijin and the Hachiman. And it's hard to win when the other carries are having that kind of performance. So right now, three members in right to try and threaten the Phoenix. Meanwhile, El Leon in mid threatening the mid tier 2 tower. And so far it's working. No one in Blue and the Woogies is contesting in mid. They'll wait for these Oni minions to push up in right and start to threaten there. The split looks like they're going to go for a 4-1 with Chapo in mid. No, he's going to join them over in right. Comes crashing down with the ultimate and looks for the back line if he can find maybe a bit more. Instead, regroups with the team. That first wave of initiation didn't quite work, so Locke didn't go to give up on it for now. You can see the pings across the map there. They're just going to take this jungle, go straight to Pyromancer, and reset. They've still got a whole four minutes on this fire giant right now, so they have no rush to really push this phoenix fight. They can go strip the jungle, take all this extra farm, and hopefully get a nice item advantage. Finish off something that's going to help you push these towers and in these team fights, and then take it one more time up this left-hand side, grab that tower, and then the best phoenix to go for. And that's where Blue and the Woogies, if, if, if anywhere in Lurmy, are going to have to find some kind of way for defense, not just factoring in the obvious tremendous 16k deficit that they're in, but how do you like their defense? I mean, I feel like Merlin does give you some pretty decent options when you're trying to defend. They do have a pretty solid defensive composition. The only problem really is this Awelix, who kind of is in a weird spot because she's so far behind where she can't really do the job of the assassin and kind of flank behind after a fight has started and then end someone's life, right? That's their job. But at this point, level 15 at 22 minutes, I mean, it's, it's just going to be a real hard struggle to be able to at least do enough damage to get someone to half health even, especially if they have all of their actives available, which basically everyone does. 
Yeah, you'd hope in a best case scenario that the Awilish could still get some value out of the ultimate, maybe behind that wall, pull someone in off a knockup. But in this scenario, anyone you pull in, you might just be initiating for them. And that's if they just don't have beads to a unit in the whole first place. So look in the woogies, it feels as though it will be an uphill battle to find some kind of way to slow this down. Locked and goaded, starting to walk their way in. Relentless One and Eonic are that front line as Leon keeps that mid wave pushed up so he can threaten mid Phoenix. He might do more than threaten mid Phoenix. No one's coming over to stop him. So he's going to walk up and start swinging at it. He'll be able to bring that down on his own. So Panda Turtle and Aqua send their attention to him. Leon's starting to recognize that now. Use the beads and retreats back towards safety. So Locked and Goaded get aggressive over in the left lane bring the left phoenix down to half hp all the while leon is not rotating he's still trying to threaten mid blue and the woogies don't know how to respond they pull in eotic to try and lock him down but too tanky at this point both phoenixes are down low and both phoenixes are gone leon still has his anvil of dawn so if they really wanted to end the game now they could bait or re-engage here and Honestly, he did just use the hammer in, so he might be in trouble. He's got no beads, so he's got to go up, which means the rest of the team might decide to just follow him in there. No ultimate left for Gamut. It already looks like he's falling down below, and down he crashes, forcing the beads on two. Gets the double kill, does Stuart. Pagon gets in on the fun as well. And everything's starting to collapse now for Blueki and the Woogies. The locked and goaded are able to find their victory here in game number one. And learn me, what are the adjustments that Blueki and the Woogies are going to have to make from here? Because essentially, nothing worked for them. Yes, they got one kill onto the board. But aside from that, this game was all locked and goaded. I think that they maybe need to just pick a better composition where they don't have two lanes that are struggling. Going up against the Emoja is hard enough without a jungler support, and now that they recognize that, I mean, Locked and Goated said, okay, we have the pressure here already, but El Leon, come on, come dive the tower in five minutes and make it happen. And so honestly, I think they need to go back to the drawing board with their game plan and kind of make a decision there. Okay, we're going to draft something with more pressure over in solo maybe to, to give our junglers some time to at least mitigate some of that issue over in duo. It's a good point. I mean, I don't know what that Wheelers could have really done to have changed that scenario much. I mean, they were behind basically from minute one, but that is only game number one. Some adjustments to be made as I get it back over to the desk in preparation for game two. Thank you, Finch and Lermy. Great job on the call for game number one. Maybe not as close as we expected this one might be, Agro, given how close these two teams are in the standings over here in North America. I mean, the, the 3v3, again, lots of conversations to be had around that here in this game. But maybe the, the biggest overarching issue of all is that this one just was not close at all. No, not at all. I mean, you look at that 3v3 slash line, 3011 for Leon, 704 for Pagon, 1010 for Ionic. I mean, that's literally <laughs> perfect. You're, you're not getting any better than that. 608 for Stuart. Relentless one, a little bit of a hard feed with the one death, of course, but I kid, he had top player damage in the whole game and was fantastic on this Kamazots. I think w when yeah. Finch asked Lermy what he thought that they should do differently, I, I think that my my big thing here for Bluegie and the Woogies is that they were on the defensive. They were on the back foot all game because Leon was setting yes. the pace perfectly on this Thor. It was the early duo lane gank. Then it was coming towards mid and towards solo. And it just felt like every time Bluegie and the Woogies was trying to do something, it was in response to whatever the Locked and Goaded was throwing out. And, and that just is a really hard way to win smite games. To, to be the, the team that's always having to respond instead of the one who's taking the initiative. And uh, Willix is not a character that does well when everyone knows you're coming and knows exactly where you are at all times. I mean, the beads pick up for Yannick in this game was really clutch in order to save him and take him out of right. the equation as a free pick. I just felt like Bluegie and the Woogies never got a chance to say, hey, where do we want to be on the map instead of where do we have to be because of right. what Locked and Goated are doing. And it's built exactly out of kind of what we figured it would be from picks and bans. This Thor, the moment that Anvil of Dawn comes online, impact somewhere on the map. Ionic rotating out on this Yemoja is going to be able to find an impact of his own. The Raijin getting a triple kill was just kind of icing on a cake. He had a couple up to that point. So, so all the, the, the puzzle pieces were in place here for Locked In Goaded. And then the conversation kind of shifts to game two now. What, what, what can be changed for Boogie and the Woogies, largely here in pick, Picks and Bands, 
after Lockton go to take game number one. Maybe the jungle has to be a topic of conversation. The Wheelix just wasn't yeah. the pick. Yeah, I guess not. I mean, I, really, I don't think that if Blueki the Woogie's play they did in game one, it won't matter what gods they have. And right. I think that that's <laughs> the, the big thing is that it just, it's just play style. They need to be more willing to, to, number one, getting lanes that can play aggressively is, is a good thing. So that the draft does matter in that. But even with that, they weren't able to really find the openings at all in that game because I felt like they were always on that back foot. So I want to see a mentality shift. And some of that does come from selecting winning lanes, an aggressive jungler. All those sorts of things are all true. But at the end of the day, it's really mentality and play style that need to change here for Luki and the Woogies, which is a lot harder than just changing which That's god true. you press lock in with in the, in the picks and bans. Yeah, I think that's a, a great point here. Lots to change for Bloogie and the Woogies. What doesn't change, though, is that second pick is going to take Persephone off the table, and Locked and Goaded being that second pick are going to keep up that 100% fan rate for the mid lane god. Yamoja as well follows, so getting something off the table for Yannick, uh, the Kamazots, Hell, all, all, all kind of staple bands here for Bluey and the Woogies, and Jormungandr is going to round it out. So not a total mentality shift for Locked and Goated. Remember, it was a total solo lane priority for Locked and Goated in their first three bands in game number one. Persephone, obviously, is going to fill one of those spots here. But Heimdall, an interesting pickup in a day where we haven't seen him yet, at least played, has been banned out a little bit. Uh, what do you make of this one for Bluey and the Woogies first overall? Yeah, I like this pick quite a bit. I'm a little surprised that Locked and Goated let it through to be honest because i think heimdall is very very strong i think that if you're going to be looking at a team that's going to play aggressively like locked and goaded giving bluey and the woogies all this extra vision and extra information that heimdall provides is a little bit surprising to me because i think that does right. help out the duo lane or the mid lane because i think that heimdall could be played in either adc or in mid all that extra information that comes with the one and the ability to see you after you cross over wards for an extended period of time. Heimdall is just good, man. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I think that it's a good first pick here for Bluegie and the Woogies. Yeah, not far off with any of that. Erlang Shen, second pick overall for Bluegie and the Woogies. In the meantime, Locked and Goated have gone back to the Thor. I mean, Leon didn't have the, the highest number of kills on his team, but was right up there as far as total kill participation goes. So not much more, I don't think, needs to be said about that Thor pick. We, we saw what he was able to do in Game 1. Expect the same from the Thor here in Game 2. The Nike pick is maybe where things start to pivot here a little bit for Locked and Goaded, and obviously a little bit of flexibility, solo lane, jungle potential, really, for the Nike. Yeah, I think that this is obviously a strong pick right now. It's being prioritized by a lot of teams. But with the Thor lock-in, I'd expect this Nike to be for a relentless oh, right. one in that solo lane. <laughs> yeah, right. And I love the Erlong Shen pick up here for Blue Gang the Woogies because this is a flex pick. It can go into jungle. It can go into support. I would guess that it's going to be support for Gamma because, again, I think that that fits the Blue Gang the Woogies play style a little bit better. And that's where I'd like to see it go just as an aggressive selection that can get you ahead in that duo lane. But even if it's in the jungle there for Panda Turtle, I definitely think it's the right mentality. It's an, initi right. it's an initiator. It wants to scrap. It wants to brawl. It wants to get its hands dirty. And I think that that's a different style of look here this time around. And it's pretty CC heavy. Uh, I, li I like the pick for Blue Gang the Woogies, even if it is a pick that we don't see that often these days. Yeah, I'm saying we don't need to say much more about the Thor than I forget that he's locked in. So it is solo lane Nike and Thor in the jungle there for Locked and Goaded. Continued support bans, though, for the second ban phase for Locked and Goaded. Good Nash Shing Chin taken off the table. I'll have to admit I was a I'm a little surprised to see the Shing Chin banned out after well, maybe the lackluster performance after game number one. Yeah, agreed. But I think it's just you want to see what else, you know, Gamma's going to play. I think it... I still think Erlong is likely or at least very possible to go over to Gamma, so I don't think that he's too upset to see all these Guardian bands taken off the table. A little surprise to see Yannick not go for the Sobek just to bring some extra initiation and displacement can really cause problems for Erlong Shen, but Terra can as well. So I think mm -hmm. that the, the Terra pick uh, with that team fight presence is still going to be quite strong. Yeah, Hercules certainly opens up some doors here as well. Merlin versus Raijin run back there in the mid lane. That'll be a lot of fun to follow on through. And then the tier 
for the fifth and final pick for Bluegie and the Woogies. Now you see the full five here, Agbro. What kind of mentality do you think Bluegie and the Woogies are maybe bringing into game number two? I think it's a much more cohesive composition to game number one. I think it's a much more aggressive composition to game number one. It's a comfort pick for Aqua in that solo lane on the tier. It's going to be Gamma on the Hercules. I'd anticipate in support. It, it's got a ton of CC and a ton of damage, but this composition I don't think recovers very well if they have a bad start. Right. So the, the early game is critical here for Bluegie and the Woogies, but they've drafted enough to, to give them a chance after a really, really bad game number one. This is the type of composition that can snowball very effectively, that can be aggressive in multiple lanes. I like it quite a bit. Thor, Raj, and Terra, do you think Locked and Goaded have themselves a 3v3 that can find similar impact to what it did in game number one? Post five, yes. I think they lose pre five pretty heavily just because the Terra amount of effectiveness is going to be pretty, pretty substantially less than that of Hercules pre five. But as soon as you get that Terra ultimate ready to go, you factor in that global uh, extra bit of reach from the Thor. I think those are right. two really, really potent factors. I think that Locked and Goaded do have to be worried about the, the group up death ball potentially from Bluegie and the Woogies because they have so much frontline that also provides a lot of damage. But if they use this Thor ultimate to stretch the map really effectively and then save the Terra ultimate for when the rotations come in and when Bluegie and the Woogies do manage to group, I think Locked and Goaded are going to be just fine. How could you ever think otherwise after the performance they just had in game number one? Yeah, it's a 24-minute game one, and really you're just waiting on minion lanes or minion waves really at that point to force down the base of Bluegie and the Woogies. The, the tool's absolutely there, I think, for both teams. Have there been enough mental changes for Bluegie and the Woogies to get back into it? Well, Fitch, Lermy, and Doug are going to take us in to game number two. That's a great point there, Dolson. The only person that's in every game is our man, Doug, and he does it without complaining. We appreciate you for keeping us going here, Doug, as we're at the end of yet another long day for you. But we'll move in to game number two here between Bluegie and the Woogies and Locked and Goaded. And Bluegie and the Woogies said, give me all the Warriors. Erlong Shen, they got the tier and the Hercules. They're ready to brawl here early. But if they don't get this off the ground, they could potentially struggle. I love this look for Bluegie and the Wings. They've drafted pretty much the highest pressure duel lane you could probably get other than Sylvanas Izanami up against two of the lowest pressure duel laners, Jingwei and Terra. So these guys are absolutely going to be doing some mad work here. And you can already see because Gamma is constantly bullying Meonic. Already level two is blue good as well, so this is going to spell trouble. The slow is there to keep Eonic in range, but with no more abilities, Eonic able to make it out of there. But you kind of gave us the long and short of this already, Lermy. There's just not enough pressure between Jingwei and Terra, especially this early in the game, for them to really have any chance of being able to step up and clear the waves. There's the blink into the push. Eonic does get locked down, and Shell just barely keeps him alive. At this point, Ionic might have to go back to base. He probably will be going into that pillar second to hopefully immune away some of the knockups coming out of Gamma. And even Blugan, if he gets close enough, and over here in the solo lane is a little bit of a different story, as I'd say these two guys are pretty evenly matched. A tier and a Nike kind of cancel each other out when you think about it, because Nike is going to be immune for the most part, but not if he's not using that rend ability. He's kind of going to have to wait there in order to kind of avoid a lot of the poke there, but instead, he takes it to the face and gets forced under tower here, just a little. Fortunately for them, though, they end up a okay on the backside of that. So we're still looking at zero zeros in the kill column, even still level one for Gamma. It looks like spending all that time trying to slow them down and delay them on the purple buff and basically giving Blukin that first wave solo did delay him a bit, but he's a okay with that. We've long accepted the logic that you trade away your lowest farm for the next best farm, but Gamma takes a little bit more poke, I think, than he was expecting there. Is still a okay, has some potions, so he should be able to get right back to farming. Soon enough, he'll get those mitigate wounds as well, so that'll help him out, especially once there's a little bit more poke firing out from Locked and Goaded's duo lane. Especially that level 3 is a pretty good spot to be as a Terra, because then you can finally do the pillar break combo, but even still, Gamma is not afraid of pushing the limits here, as he nearly gets under the tower, and instead, though, he's going to continue to back off just a little bit as the purple buff has finally respawned. 
But now, this pressure they're looking for will be joined by Panda Turtle. But look at this rotation from Locked In Goaded. They're bringing even more people, and suddenly Gamma is just bait there in the back line. He will fall for first blood as Stuart gets that last hit. That's huge. They're not only able to find that first kill, Larry, but put that kill over to their Jing Wei, who had been struggling. That's going to help a lot. Oh yeah, getting the Jingwei off the ground is such a great way to start us off here in this duo lane for Locked and Goated. The fact of the matter is that that extra kill is going to help her at least fight against this Heimdall just a little bit, which she clearly is going to need. I mean, Heimdall is one of the most respected gods, you would say, probably has the most pressure up in the duo lane other than Izanami, but Izanami falls off. Heimdall really doesn't. Those autos will swing the entirety of the game. Yeah, that's going to be scary. It's a good point to make that you're always going to worry about Heimdall. Good beads, though, from Stuart means he does not get pushed by Gamma, but it was good by Gamma to put Stuart under that pressure in the first place. So a great exchange over in duo ends up costing Stuart the beads, but he should still be okay. That's the part of the reason why you pick Jingwei, is even without beads, she's got plenty of escapes when she hits level 5. One thing I want to touch on here is check out this <gasps> Chalice of the Oracle here getting picked up and a little bit of a close call there for Pagon momentarily, but Ionic might be the one in trouble here as he actually does get pulled back. But the squad's there to peel him out. And back to the point here about this Chalice of the Oracle. We haven't seen this yeah. item for a very long time. I think that it's it's an interesting choice here, especially because the Vision Shard still exists until level 12. But I think that in all actuality, Ionic was just really worried about an early rotation. He thought, you know, maybe the fact that Leon is going to be there helps him out for sure. But Panda Turtle would definitely have taken a lesson from last game and put his focus elsewhere. And that's kind of why he's looking to pick up this extra bit of vision so that he can at least be prepared for it and know where he's coming from. Yeah, especially knowing they were going into a matchup where they were against a bunch, bunch of pressure and had so little pressure, it was very likely that they were going to be invaded and one more member right rotate over to try and complete that. So perhaps that's the idea there for Miana, because to try and make sure they could be aware of it. But luckily, they had plenty of backup coming in their own right. Leon helps them turn around, and it's actually locked and goaded that got first blood. And we said at the beginning of this, Lurmi, that Luki and the Woogies really needed to get off to a good start. But I don't think just this one kill that locked and goaded got was enough to lock to really put Blue and the Wookiees out of this by any means. No, they're only really behind that first blood bounty here, but with Aquarius taking away this blue, it's going to get a little bit more difficult on all sides of the map, because we've been seeing that Eldeon has been putting basically all his pressure up in the left-hand side here, and leaving Relentless to kind of do whatever he pleases, and going against a tier, I mean, tier is not as dangerous as he used to be with that bizarre move and speed build that we saw for a while, but now that that's been kind of lifted off, he is a little bit less of a danger to the rest of the game. So I don't think I'd mind really Elyon just keeping this pressure over here in duo. I think it's a good choice and we might just see that continue to happen. So honestly, if I'm Panda Turtle, I'm going to have to show up in this left side this game. Right, I really don't think he has much other option. It does look like, at the very least, that Aqua might be going that same route as Talaria plus the Blink to start off. That's pretty standard fare for our tiers. We'll get our best idea in just a moment if he does like to go for that same movement, build, movement speed build you were just referencing had been nerfed a little bit. Red buff spawning. Gamma is here alongside Panda Turtle and even a little bit of backup from Crimson as well. They want to try and find this invade, but right up into the ultimate goes Pagon. That pushes everybody back. Leon dunks down as well and is able to lock down one more member, but Panda Turtle should be getting that heal shortly. He gets it, but Gamma does not. He falls yet again this game. That's twice that this Hercules support has fallen. This is not a good look for Hercules, who tends to be really, really strong in the early game. The fact that he's even still ahead of Yannick at that point after falling it twice is is kind of an interesting thing to look at because being able to have that early game pressure does allow you to kind of go and do whatever you want for the first couple of minutes, because who's going to fight a Hercules at level three or whatever at that point in the game? Nobody, really. But honestly, when you're rotating four members over to take him down, that's kind of the only way you can deal with him. And that's exactly what Locked and Goated have been doing. And if they're going to continue on this war path, they really need to be careful, because the Bloody and the Woogies, if they're smart, are going to come up with a response to this. They're going to need to. Gamma showing up, finding the two-man driving strike and stealing the blue buff. Not a bad play. And Leon will be the one that suffers because of it. Aqua rotates over, cuts him down, and finds a kill. And even with Gamma having taken two deaths, he can still make big plays like that on the Herc basically any time. 
And this was the response that they needed to do. I'm so glad the Gamma has finally got up and said, okay, I'm not gonna fight in duo anymore. You've been on top of me all this game so far. So let's make it happen in solo where there is also some pressure already. And Panda Turtle is continuing to fight out with Yannick here, but he's gotta be careful using the ultimate, but he's all by himself. He's not gonna get anything, but trading out those ultimates is pretty good because like we've talked about, Terra ultimate can be a game changer in a lot of team fights. It can be. So even though I don't know that Panda Turtle really was going to be able to get the kill in a world where Ionic used the ultimate, he's probably okay just with taking the ultimate as they own takes to the sky. Blugen seems unaware, dunked down, and that's free for locked and goaded. Blugen even ceremoniously giving over his beads on the way out. I'm sure locked and goaded are happy to take those too. One after the other. Every single time Eldeon makes this rotation and uses the ultimate on this left-hand side, something good has happened, right? So there's nothing yeah, stopping him from just keeping going over there every single time. And the response has been kind of weak from Lugi and the Woogies. They tried to steal away this red, and it looks like they might have done it. So at least they get something from it, but it's not going to really change unless they keep getting some kills or make this a consistent habit of taking it away. This is still not too bad, though. They're within range, and Gamma, who will fall again, is the only one that's really fallen this game, except for that one death onto Blugit. So I don't think Blugit and the Woogies should feel too bad. I mean, look at the charts. They're down a 1,000 gold, despite the 4-1 to kills. Not that far behind in experience either. In fact, those are slightly in favor of Blugit and the Woogies. So to kind of keep track of it, they're really still very much even in this game, even forcing out Relentless One's ultimate, though it might end up costing Panda Turtle his life. He makes it into the turtle form, but Leon chases him down, gets the kill, and even uses the ultimate on the tail end. This just seems to be every single fight where one member is getting caught out alone and then they're able to turn that around because the grouping coming out from Locked and Goaded just seems like it's on another level. These shot calls from El Leon have been pretty much perfect this entire time. The only time they ever kind of messed sure. up is when he a little bit overcommitted around that red buff earlier and fell down. So uh, honestly, but if I'm El Leon, I've got four of the five kills that my team has gotten, and I have that extra bit of, what, two levels right now on top of Panda Turtle? This is looking good for him. It is, and he's going to have to continue being that driving force for them because Crimson is a good bit ahead of Pagon to sort of balance that out in the middle lane. The only person on the map that's level 12 right now is this Merlin. So as good as it's looking for Leon, there is something similar happening on the other side of the map. Now, can a Merlin single-handedly dictate the pace the way a Thor can? No, right? The Thor can use that ultimate to basically decide where fights happen. But it is still something that Locked and Goda got to make sure they're mindful of. Yeah, it seems like Crimson has basically just been sitting back and farming, which is kind of characteristic of a lot of the ways oh. that he likes to play. He likes to wait for something to happen and for something to come to him, and it might just happen as Gamma's getting poked out yet again. That's his fourth spill of the day. Yeah, that is a bit brutal here for Gamma so far throughout this early game, but still, we kind of have to keep our wits about us because he's kept it even despite all those deaths. Leon dunking down, does get the beads out from Panda Turtle who responds with the ultimate, so he knows he has a heal in the back pocket. That's why he continues to surge forward looking for Ionic. The knockup is there and Crimson able to get his first kill of the game. The not going be able to find much more on the back of it, but a kill onto Ionic is pretty huge for Blue and the Woogies. They needed something. Yeah, they were able to take him down earlier in the match, but getting out Yannick is actually pretty good because that one went straight onto a Rough Crimson. And now with the rotation of these stone laners, this fight is broken wide what? open. Not only that, but Seward's here too. Yeah, Panda Turtle getting real aggressive trying to make something happen there in the middle lane. Not quite going to be able to get the kill, but they were correct about being able to get out with their lives. So now that we're at this point here in the match, Lurmy, where we know where the only lead for Blue and the Woogies is, that's in the middle lane, and we know where the big lead is for Locked and Goaded, that's in the jungle. Which one of those do you favor? At this point, it's gotta be Elyon on this Thor. Like we said earlier, the jungler has the most impact across the map globally. And of course, it's not it's like true. Crimson has been doing a poor job. He's been doing a great job at power farming where his jungler has not been there because his jungler is trying to really work at counter and matching uh, up against Elyon. But basically, in all that time, Crimson's just been sitting waiting. He's been getting all this farm. He says, just you wait. I'm going to get some more items, and this is going to break wide open back in my squad's favor. 
that's got to be the hope now for Blue and the Woogies, that they just keep this one relatively close. Because even still, this is way better than they were at the same point last game. I think it was at the seven minute mark when it was already a 4,000 gold lead or something like that back in game one. So this is already worlds better. The improvement is clearly here. And I think the Warriors are a big part of it. They're able to fight much more into the early game. And by fight, I guess I meant take the objectives. They're at least pulling the gold theory. But locked and coded are here. Leon and Ionic are nearby. This will not go down for free. Ionic drops the ultimate to try and bring them into that kill threshold, but Blue and the Woogies are respectful. They drop the Gold Fury and back right out of there. That's just the power of Elion having that ultimate there. Once he goes up in the sky, the entire side of Blue and the Woogies needs to be more careful because no one wants a Thor to dunk down straight on their head, especially when they're sitting at this 75% threshold across three characters and Everyone's made their way over here now, so it looks like this Gold Fury fight might at least dampen out for a second as everyone's kind of chilling and going back to their side. No one wants to fight while those ults are down, and clearly, Bloogie and the Woogies don't really feel like it's their time to shine either. They're going to take a bit of a back seat, it feels like, here. You mentioned it, the Silmarillioners were here as well, so it's a good time to sort of check back in on their builds, and it is the movement speed build for Aqua, as we might have thought, though it is going to be that slightly weakened version of it, the Relic Dagger and the Wing Blade right on the back of those Talaria boots. Meanwhile, Relentless One has the Mystical Mail, but Relentless One might be getting locked down. Feels like he has to use the Sentinel of Zeus Hammer, double taps onto Panda Turtle, so he's low already. Pagon making his way here, and he's got plenty of damage. It's Tycho Drums, flattens Gamma early on, and already the numbers advantage in favor of Locked and Goaded. But can they find more wall on the wrong side of Aqua? Blue and the Woogies should be able to disengage. Yonix taking a peek down here, just wanting to get some of these timers to see if there's any possible re-engagement here, but he's all by himself. He's got to be careful, but thankfully, since he's pushed down that pillar, he's not going to be able to get pushed by Aquarius, so he'll be safe for now, but really, he's just trying to open up a pathway for Relentless One to pass him by and steal away this blue. And I think it's a good time while we're talking about the solo laners here, Lorme, to talk about their relative value. Now that we know that this is how the early game went with neither team really having much value from their solo laners, you might have to come back to it later. Locked and goaded have the Gold Fury down to half HP. Blugan and Crimson are nearby, but they're able to do enough all on their own. Locked and goaded drop the Gold Fury. They didn't want to flip for it. So I guess we can go back to talking about which one of these solo laners do you think is going to be more impactful here at this stage? It really depends, but I'm really liking what I'm seeing from Relentless One. He's actually picked up the Mystical Mail, which is an item we don't see a whole lot anymore. But the whole reason behind that is that they want to keep the enemy team from blinking in and stopping their carries from doing what they're doing. That's kind of the whole deal of getting that item, because as you can see, two members of Blue King the Woogies do have that blink, and both of them have really big displacement tools. So stopping either of them from getting to the back line, forcing out some beads or anything like that, that's probably number one priority here for Relentless. And so I think if he's able to do that, then really this tier is kind of invalidated. Yeah, there's something to be said for that additional ability to keep other players in combat through those extra ticks. And that's what that Mystical Mail will allow for Relentless One to do. So good point there, Lormi. Perhaps that can be a deal a deal breaker later on in the game if Relentless One can kind of keep his back line extra safe by not allowing the Tear or the Hercules, perhaps, to sort of blink past him. Relentless One, though, does have the angle here on Panda Turtle as he comes underneath him, forces the Turtle Form out, actually gets the knockup, and forces the ultimate out single-handedly in Leon. One's gonna follow up Anvil of Dawn for the kill, and Panda Turtle never stood a chance. Leon's gotta be careful though, he just used the hammer out, and Relentless One's gonna help get himself out as well. So, a very, very clean disengage for the boys of Locked and Goaded. I'm honestly surprised they just let them get away with that. We saw two members pushing up in mid. I would have thought they would have wrapped around there and tried to pick one of them off. But instead, they kind of backed up. And this is what Agra was talking about in that game one, where it felt like Locked and Goaded were the team that were doing all the aggressive moves, and Belugi and the Woogies were basically responding. I think they've done a much better job about it this game. We saw them looking for purple buff invades on the back of this Hercules pressure. We saw Gamma move over to Solo and help Aqua go for a couple of invades over on that blue buff as well. They've been more active this game, but hasn't it felt like that's kind of fallen away? That was for those first 10 minutes. And now that it hasn't worked, they're basically on the back foot. 
their thought process right now is somewhere along the lines of, okay, Eldeon is huge. We have to deal with him somehow. And so they've gone from that thought process of, okay, let's find some kind of counter to it. They just need to mitigate him at this point because it's gotten to the point where it's just too late for that. He's got six kills. He's four levels up. And that's kind of something we don't really see at this level. You never really see a jungler that far behind at this point in the game. We're not even 20 minutes. And it just really feels like Panda Turtles dropped the ball here. I gotta agree, man. I don't know that this Erlong Shin pick was it here in this situation as ultimates traded out. Aqua and Pagon both have to use theirs up by the Chaos side tier 2 tower. But yeah, Panda Turtle has not really had a chance to go aggressive. He's always using his ultimates defensively, but I asked for Bloogie and the Woogies to make an offensive play. Well, what about the Gold Fury? They take it, but Leon comes dunking in and Panda Turtle, we just brought his name up. He is the casualty of war, but trading your lowest value member for Gold Fury is not that bad here at this point. If they can get out and only lose one. Looks like that's exactly what happened, and thankfully there's nothing for Locked and Gota to be able to invade here, but with the only person in left being Gamma, looks like this tower is going to go down pretty much without a fight. Elyon taking it up for just a second, but it's going to fall down right away, and honestly, they could choose to go for this tier 2 here as everyone's kind of spread back out again. Does look like Gamma is going to help out here, but not going to be for long as they are going to lose those minions, and they're going to have to back up just a little bit. Yeah, it would be a little too much, I think, to grab that tower there. At least that's what Locked and Goaded felt, so they start to back up. Red buff successfully defended by Aquarius, and I guess it's his now. So he grabs it and looks to try and get the most involved that he can by adding a little bit of extra damage. Might perhaps be the idea there from him. So at least for now, things have slowed down a bit. You can tell with the gold charts that getting that gold fury did help out with Bluey and the Woogies to get things back at least a little bit towards even. There's that little bit of spike up, but look, there's the tier one tower, and that brought it almost all the way back down. So it got heavily mitigated on the back by good play from Locked and Coded. And 2,500 at this point in the game is not a big deal. The only problem is, sure. is that it's really all focused around the difference between Elyon and Panda Turtle. We're even seeing that Rep Crimson currently is two levels in the lead over top of Pagon. Right. So you can really see where the inequality lies is who's going to be the harder carry. Is it Leon or is it going to be Crimson? They're going to need Crimson to really step up from them. And we started having this exact discussion, is it going to be Leon or Crimson, like 10 minutes ago. And really, we haven't seen Crimson turn on the Jets much since then. But I don't think they need him to. The real thing that Blink and the Woogies have done well has been damage control. The fact that this lead has relatively plateaued at this 2 to 3k gold mark is actually pretty big for Blink and the Woogies. As long as they can hold on, they're eventually going to have a fed late game Merlin on their side. And that's pretty scary too. That is true, but I also have to give credit over to Locked and Goaded. They've drafted a very late game comp, and so they're going to be able to deal with that quite well. But it looks like they're going to be aggressive here around the Fire Giant. Leon goes right to the back and finds two. Crimson already in some trouble, trying to escape to the right, but Stuart is there, knows where the priority is, and Iana gets the kill. Must have been the ultimate or something finally shutting him down. Balogun gets the response, though, into Leon. That's a big kill, but Pagon showing up with the double. Shuts down two. Aqua has already been sent back to the graveyard, and Gamma trying to run for his life, but that's a Jingwei hunting you down. A little bit of revenge for the early game as Stuart finds the kill under the Hercules. Four for one in favor of Locked and Goaded. They took down the carry, but the rest of the team was already so fed that it didn't even matter. Like you said, four for one, but in the favor of Locked and Goated. And now this opens them up to this fire giant at 21 minutes. Of course, it's not too, too early in the match, but even still, it's kind of a, a rough call here because they will be able to get this. And that just means those tier ones that are available that are taking a ton of damage are going to go down so incredibly fast, especially since they're going to be able to shred through this pyromancer and head back that much faster. <laughs> Unfortunate for Leon, he basically got them to this point in the game by, by controlling the entire game, but unfortunately has to miss out on the Fire Giant buff. I doubt he'll be complaining too much, though. It's on the whole rest of the squad. They'll be able to get plenty of value out of it. And Lermy, there's so many towers up on the map for them to go grab to add even more onto that gold lead. Things are really start to balloon out of control here for Bloogie and the Wookiees. And I think they might even have to just fall back and defend on Phoenixes. Do you see a world where they can try and defend these Tier 2 towers? 
They could, but the only time that will ever work out is if they group up as five on top of one person split pushing. And honestly, if it's gonna be anyone, it's probably gonna be Elyon by himself at any point. We saw this last game where Elyon goes off by himself, uses the ultimate to come back and join the rest of the squad. So if that's gonna be the case, it might not even work out beyond that because that ultimate is a semi-global. It'll take you pretty much halfway across the map. So they're not gonna be able to chase him that far unless they've really thought out and big brained exactly exactly where he's gonna land. It looks like they largely agree with you here, Alarmy. They don't see a whole lot of worlds where defending on the tier two tower is gonna really work out for them. So Bloogie and the Woogies fall back to Phoenixes. I gotta find myself agreeing with that call at this point too. So the tier two tower in left is the one that goes down first. Tier two tower in mid will be next up. Locked and goaded with this positioning now, Make it seem like they might even want to head over towards the right tier two and grab it. At the very least, Leon's heading that way. But the rest of Locked and Goated want this next Fury instead. They'll be here for it right when it spawns. Primal will mean they can do even more damage to that Fire Giant the next time it's up. This has been really clean from Locked and Goated. I know the early game was close, but as soon as they found their opening, they took this lead completely out of control. They're now going to be pushing up this left-hand side, perhaps. It looks like actually... Going back to base will be the squad. Yeah. They probably are thinking about that. They still have about three minutes left on this fire giant, so I wouldn't be surprised if they wanted to try and go for a phoenix. They certainly are able to. Just waiting for everyone to maybe make that next big buy and come back with another item to help them out in these team fights. Because clearly, like you said, we've been seeing this lead ballooning a ton, and now it's kind of coming to a head here. If they're able to get a phoenix, that might just be it. They could end off that point, and the base is pretty exposed at this point. Yeah, it'd be very surprising if we saw Bluey and the Wookiee sent down to the lower bracket in a 2-0 like this. But that's exactly what's on the line for them. Up against the team that's the next closest to them in the standings. And, and aside from maybe that those first 10 minutes in the early game so far, I mean, it really has not been all that close. Aqua narrowly able to avoid the pressure from Locked and Goated in right. He should be safe. Ionic finds the wall, but isn't able to get the stun. So Aqua makes it out of there A-OK. -okay. Locked and go to take down that tier two tower. And with plenty of time left, another 50 seconds or so on that fire giant buff, they can start looking to burn down this right side. Phoenix, they're not even gonna await. Oh, Ionic steps in right away and uses the ultimate on the back line. Leon takes to the sky as well, looking for a place to land with the Anvil of Dawn, but he's been patient so far. He likes to fall down onto Gamma. The CC chain is strong and Gamma falls early on. That's big control on the right hand side, but Pagon comes out the better, shuts down Panda Turtle and Locked and Goated have already found their 2-0. Not only that, but they grab the Phoenix as well, and they're just going to head out yeah, with their heads held be high. Cause they honestly, that was just free for them. It was very close to bitten bad, and that was all off the back of Aquarius getting a phenomenal triple push there into the Phoenix again. And you can see the health bars were getting dangerously low there, especially for Yannick on that front hand side. And the fact that they all got out of that alive is honestly pretty surprising to me, but they're gonna have to slow their roll just a little bit and wait for the next Fire Giant to come up. When it comes down to it, they did get the Phoenix closest to the Fire Giant side. So at least Bluegie and the Woogies will have a slightly easier time of getting it, uh, defending that one. But it doesn't look like they're gonna take their foot off the gas pedal here as Bluegie's gonna pop the beans, but he barely makes it out of that one alive. He just does take him through the Bifrost, and it was a good Bifrost. It was a good Bifrost, but it costs him everything, all right? Uh, not to do an Avengers shout-out here, but Blugan now without the Beads or the Aegis. And I imagine the Bifrost on a pretty substantial cooldown as well. That was a pretty long transportation. I couldn't quite see how far he went with it, but he had to give up a lot to survive there. Meanwhile, Locked and Goaded should be in position for this Fire Giant in the next 10 seconds. And I don't think Blue and the Woogies can come out to try and contest it. They've got to make sure that they keep these Fire Minions out in right, keep the Minions pushed up and left, and try and defend their base the best they can. They could honestly take a look at it, but if they did, they'd just get fully committed on it, and that would be the game. So you're right here. The call is definitely correct to just sit and defend the base, and especially going to be helpful that this Fire Giant is not yet enhanced, so at least they have that on their side to deal with at least a little bit better. But if they're going to defend here, it's got to be off the back of Aquarius getting another insane bit of CC. 
I mean, I saw it happen, man. I think there were three members of them. You can kind of see that marker on them when they're under the crowd control. I couldn't tell exactly what had happened, but Aqua had three members underneath the Fearless locked down. And they're not even going to give us time to do any more recaps. Locked and Coded are right underneath the Mid Phoenix trying to establish some pressure. One person has already been caught up inside that ultimate from Belugan coming right back down. It was a relentless one, but he got a whole new health bar off the ultimate so he can keep right on trucking. They push out a couple members, get the Mid Phoenix down low, but Luke and the Woogies are holding on for now, but in comes that Anvil of Dawn. Dunks down onto one. Aqua pushes him right back, and Gamma is the one that pays for it. Big Taunt coming out from Panda Turtle as well. It actually sets up for Crimson to get the kill on Tubionic, but they've already lost the mid-Phoenix Lurmy, and Locked and Goaded are ready to leave. Taking that mid Phoenix did cost them a bunch. They lost their main tank and their source of sustain, so it's not the best situation for them. But of course, it still is a great place to be in. You do love to have two Phoenixes down on the enemy. What, 16,000 gold in the lead at this point? And at, at that it's big a of a lead, you're honestly getting to the point where you could maybe even start to sell off your boots. But a lot of people do have their blessings still. So getting that fifth item besides the boots is going to be incredibly helpful for these guys. And honestly, if I'm Bluegie and the Woogies, I am shaking in my boots right now. They're going to have to be dealing with this squad coming back at full fervor. And they've only got one Phoenix to their name. It's been very patient, though, from Locked and Goaded. They've got such a tremendous lead that they feel as though they could have potentially forced some of these fights a little bit more. But this, to me, feels like Ch Chapo or Leon's kind of signature style to me. He does he does like to play patient. He doesn't like to take these unnecessary risks. When, if it's 100% chance to win, if we back, reset, and then siege again, then that's the line that he wants to take. So I 100% I think that that's some of Leon's influence there as they're playing this one by the book, by the number and not giving Bluegie and the Woogies any chance to get back into it. Chapo of the past might have disagreed with you there, but now that Chapo's got <laughs> the amount of experience that he does, he's in here a lot more controlled than he used to be with these calls. And like you said, if there's any chance that they can take an, an L in these fights, he's going to say, no, we're going to slow it down, take the guaranteed wins, and then push from there. And like we've been saying, they have all their ultimates back up. Yannick respawned also with his ultimate, but no Fire Giant available. They've got two red buffs to their name. This Phoenix is as good as dead, and it's all about the fight that comes after. Leon's keeping the minions pushed up and right. This is this is exactly how you see it, by the way. Minions pushed up in every single lane. That puts maximum pressure on Belugi and the Woogies. And Gamma is under maximum pressure himself. Does manage to get off at least one push, but Pagon puts him in the grave right afterwards. Pagon gets the double kill. Belugan able to reposition, hold on to his life for a moment, but he can't even get back to the fountain. Relentless one gets the third kill as this game starts to careen out of control for Belugi and the Woogies. Locked and goaded, bearing down onto the Titan. It's down to half HP, and Locked and Goaded are done with day number one. They take care of the Titan, take care of Bluegie and the Woogies, and they'll chill on further in the upper bracket. A little bit closer game there for Bluegie and the Woogies, but still, this leadership coming out from Elion as the new jungler here for Locked and Goaded has really proven its worth. He has been on top of this, and clearly both games we saw that he was the big shot caller, the playmaker, and everything in between, and it's got to be, honestly, what other way can you do it with that Thor on your back? Yeah, all those superlatives. We'll, we'll rain those on the lay on for an excellent game. Really the entirety of Locked and Goaded playing very clean, especially as you mentioned, because game two is much different. They faced all those warriors. They faced all that early pressure, and they were still able to answer it. I think that purple buff rotation that they did for first Blood Lurmy was a little bit bigger than maybe we gave it credit for. That stopped a lot of that early momentum. Yeah, hitting level 5 was a really great point to pick that uh, time to attack. A lot of the times the jungler in the middle hit that point faster, so being able to make a play exactly at that moment comes from only the top of the top. Yeah, good awareness from them, and it stopped all that early aggression. Congrats to Locked and Coded as they move on to the early bracket, and I'll move it back down over to the desk so they can break it down. Yeah, technically is closer here in game 2, but... Anything is going to be closer than game one, but it wasn't that much closer. Locked and goaded, still run away with this one in about a 30-minute game. Aggro still with me to break down the game and round out the day. More of the same, though, from locked and goaded aggro. Leon makes some big plays on the Thor, and though stagnated a little bit, snowballs out of control by the end. 
I think that Finch and Lermy put it pretty well in that game. It was pretty much who could make more plays between Lyon and Crimson. And Crimson was very far ahead in that game, was doing a lot. But Lyon and the rest of Locked and Goaded just were able to get win after win after win, oftentimes picking off Gamma on that Hercules in order to get those incremental advantages. Pagan was behind in farm, but Lyon was making such a big impact that it just didn't seem to matter. I feel like Locked and Goaded really have an understanding of how they want to play these games. I think that they're, they're playing really cleanly overall. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this game, not as much of a blowout, but still pretty one-sided for the vast majority of this game. And, and Leona playing this Thor is something that Baskin and the boys, I think, have to take note of going into their games later on this Agreed. weekend. I do want to give quick shout-outs. Ultimately not game-changing, but I think Panda Turtle had some great nine turns blessings throughout this game. Unfortunately, just yeah. so behind that there wasn't necessarily the follow-up there. Kind of springboarding off that Thor comment, though, and, and maybe touching on Leon just a little bit more. Eight, three, and nine. Maybe zoom out meta meta picture type conversation here. Thor, do you think he's prioritized correctly, under prioritized, or, or do you think he's in a, a spot where uh, he, he's being identified as a threat pretty accurately? I think it's it, it, he's good. He's definitely a strong jungler still. I think that he is pretty player dependent. Some some junglers would rather yeah. have more all-in characters that can just go in there and get their hands dirty sure. early on, and you don't have to set up the team as much as Thor likes to do. Obviously, when Thor gets super far ahead, he can one-shot people by himself, but for the most part, Thor is really a teamwork jungler more than an individual one. So I think that it's team play style, individual jungler style. I think that Thor is certainly one of the best assassins in the game, but frankly, all assassins are pretty much the same because they all build Erendite and Heartseeker and one-shot squishies anyways. So it's, it's really <laughs> down to how your team executes around those junglers more than the actual god pick itself. Yeah, right, jungle. E you know, easiest meta. They're all the same. Yeah, it's, it's mid lane speaking. This is the mid lane desk right now. Look, I agree with you. I mean, they're going to jump on That's me and one-shot me anyway, right? Like, what, what am I going to do? Here's your bracket. After day number one over in North America, you brought up Baskin and the boys needing to take a look at that Thor, maybe. And that's because they'll be playing locked and goaded in the semifinal. Still best of three there. And then our losers today, gone to Tahiti and Boogie and the Woogies, facing off in the losers round number one. We figured North America might be a little bit more contested. A lot of that thanks to Belt Slap over in EU. But back-to-back 2-0s -back over here in North America may be a little bit surprising. Let's see what we've got on the schedule, though. This will be uh, moving into tomorrow smiley face cold llamas belt slap versus the poppies uh, and then obviously the teams we just outlined there so belt slap looking to move forward baskin and the boys looking to move forward as well but should be some close matchups in the winner's bracket side of things tomorrow looking forward to it i think that the especially that na winner side both teams look so dominant today that i'm really looking forward to seeing how they're going to play the poppies yeah. up against belt slap belt slap looked mortal Today I ended up dropping a game to Smiley Face, so that should be doesn't a really fun nothing. match to watch. This sure does not. So I think that this it's going to be a fun Saturday for sure and should set us up for a pretty p fantastic finals on Sunday. Well, that was a great day number one of SCC Phase 2 playoff action. Finally got some competitive smite back, so that's always a great sign. But that is it for this fine Friday of Smite. Make sure to tune in tomorrow, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Day two of the SEC Phase 2 playoffs will kick off. So on behalf of myself, Agro, all of the casters working with us here this weekend, and of course, production. Thank you guys for watching, and we'll see you tomorrow. Peach it.